I was born into the world of space exploration. I grew up in what I call Sarabhai Ahmedabad, which was, you know, a time of renaissance where technology, architecture, design, the arts intermingled, which is why I, I sort of, you know, did my foundation in engineering, went on to become an industrial designer, uh, became part of a multidisciplinary space program, and then eventually even did a PhD in aerospace architecture. So yeah, I think I sort of charted my own path, if you ask me, Harsh, uh, because there was no straight path to becoming an aerospace architect. And then the entrepreneurship happened because after working at NASA Johnson in Houston uh, and working at Boeing in California, um, I mean, on one hand, I, I got to learn a lot. I got to see real flight hardware. I got to see how missions are designed and flown. But then I got to a point where I decided I needed more freedom um, to express myself, uh, to speak freely. Uh, you know, when you work for mega corporations or when you work for large space agencies, you have to toe the line. Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of a free spirit. So I decided, hey, the best way to be independent then is to start your own company. So I started my own little outfit in San Francisco in 2000 and then co-founded another little company in Vienna in Austria. Uh, that company is now 17 years old. Uh, we design and build um, space habitats, rovers, um, full-scale prototypes, you know, um, uh, spacesuits uh, and all of that kind of stuff. And we test them in analog environments. And then I moved back to India and started my third venture, Earth to Orbit. It just sounds so fascinating as you're describing that. Can you take us again back to the moment where you were growing up around the pioneers of space? So in the late 60s, uh, somewhere in 1967, my father had just returned from Germany and Sarabhai had started recruiting young engineers um, for his space program. And my dad was one of the early dream team uh, that Sarabhai put together. So I was surrounded by these people who um, came together to build the country's first uh, antennas, the first launch pads, the first satellites, the first rockets. And the other milieu that I was um, uh, sort of, you know, were part of this, my formative years were contemporary architects. So Ahmedabad was then a city which was uh, patronized by cotton mill owner families. And these industrial families would invite amazing contemporary architects, both from India and abroad, to build public structures and private residences. So we had uh, Corbusier, we had Louis Kahn, we had Charles Correa, we had Doshi. I mean, I used to even wake up to like my study window when I used to open it up, I could see Doshi's vault architecture at a distance. I could bicycle to Louis Kahn's I am Ahmedabad campus. So if you sort of bring space and architecture together and juxtapose them, what you have is space architecture. And that's what I got smitten by. It's an invented discipline, you know. Growing up, there was no such discipline as space architecture. It took us almost 20 years, a handful of us from around the world, to convince the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics to make aerospace architecture a professional discipline because the engineers were pushing back. Um, they could not initially understand what is it that architects and industrial designers can do for us, you know, because they were so focused on safety and survivability of their pressurized capsules that they didn't realize that habitability and psychological factors, human factors are as important as engineering factors. So that's what captured my imagination. And I decided, hey, you know, I want to be designing things for living off the planet, living in an extraterrestrial environment where you cannot take gravity for granted or atmospheric pressure for granted, you know, or even natural illumination and the colors that we see here on Earth for granted. I think the other interesting aspect of the times uh, I grew up in was the world was a safer place. It was an open place. I could quite literally, with my bicycle, um, bicycle over to some of the finest institutes in the city. So whether it's the Space Application Center, the School of Architecture, the National Institute of Design, the Physical Research Laboratory, um, Indian Institute of Management, and all of these institutes had amazing people and amazing libraries. 
So we didn't need permission. I didn't need permission or nobody would stop me at the gates of these institutes. It was quite porous. And I think I took full advantage of that and quite literally drowned myself through whatever resources that I could lay my hands on. I would come up with imaginary problems of living and working in microgravity. And then I would go about solving those problems. I had my dad's German portable typewriter. So I used to type up my projects on it and I used to draw by hand. And I would, if I wanted an expert who I wanted to talk to, I would look them up in these institutes and you know show up in their offices. And it was a very friendly environment to be in. I mean, these days, even to enter one of these campuses, you would have to go through campus security. So I think I think it was the time that I was born into and the milieu that I was born into, uh, which drew me into space exploration. Just to give you a background about how I got into space in terms of like just being interested in and exploring it through Biscuit was, was uh, in 2017 when India launched the historical 104 satellites. It was the first time that I really thought about India as a space force. I wanted to know from your perspective, if you can walk us through like a brief uh, history of India's space journey. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, let me work it backwards. So I played, um, I would say uh, quite immodestly. I mean, I, I played a pivotal role in making that 104 satellite launch happen because I moved back to India in 2008 and started my third venture, Earth to Orbit. And we spent the first seven years um, trying to figure out how to bring more foreign launches to the PSLV rocket. So we started with this vision that we wanted to make the PSLV rocket the most sought after rocket in its class. And the European nations would come to India for launching their payloads on the PSLV because we have great bilateral relations with them. But we never had Americans come and launch on the PSLV because the US had imposed an embargo on India when India conducted uh, its first nuclear test. And as a result of that embargo, uh, American satellite makers uh, were not allowed to launch on an Indian rocket. And in fact, American companies were not even allowed to sell components to India. So it was part of this, what we call the technology apartheid regime, uh, which was very unfair, of course, but it was there. So one of the mission impossibles we took up as a young, in fact, India's first space starter was how do we make that happen? And um, the launch client, our first launch client was a Stanford startup called Skybox. And since both of us were startups, we were not big companies, uh, we had nothing to lose. And we said, let's give it a shot. So it took us five years um, Skybox in California hired a high profile ITAR lawyer. These are export control, there are export control regulations from the Cold War time which still exist. So anything that's made in the US and has to fly on a foreign rocket becomes a defense article. And you need all kinds of clearances to be able to do that. So they hired a very high profile ITAR lawyer on their side. And on our side, I went out and had conversations with more than a dozen diplomats in Washington, D.C. and Delhi over, over three years. And finally, we convinced the State Department to allow us to launch the Skybox satellite on the PSLV. The first historic launch agreement was signed between ISRO and Skybox in um, five years from the day we started negotiating this. So what you saw on February of 2018, 96 out of those 104 satellites were American satellites. And that wouldn't have happened had Skybox and Earth to Orbit not spent those five years building a bridge between our countries and despite export control regimes, despite embargoes, make it possible for Americans to get permission from their government to launch on an Indian rocket. And that's how. So 96 out of 104 were American satellites. Uh, and I think what it also speaks to ISRO's technical prowess. It is extremely sophisticated choreography, orbital choreography. You know, when you have 104 birds riding on a single rocket and each one of them has to be released at the right moment and be inserted into the right orbit, the level of precision that you need to achieve that choreography is mind boggling. And I think the fact that you were, um, you know, you you were totally blown away by 
by not the fact that it was a it was a record launch, but 104 satellites. I think it's sent out a very clear message to the world that ISRO scientists are able to do very, very difficult and sophisticated things. The the one the record before that was 37 satellites on a Russian rocket. I always thought Rakesh Sharma was your uh, was was the one bright spot kind of thing. I got to Rakesh Sharma only after that. So it was this 104 satellite launch yeah. that caught your attention as, oh my God, India must be a space power. You know, how can you be launching 104 satellites on a rocket? It's what made me realize I didn't know anything about ISRO or its history. I was not expecting to find anything that interesting. I thought it would be more technical. But then when you start reading into the context of these different things, and when you started running in parallel to what was happening in the world, then suddenly things become so interesting because each nation, each agency is, is trying to advance its own cause to, you know, project the sense of power, uh, project uh, the sense of like technological superiority. You know, India, when we did the 104 launch, we were not trying to project anything. We were just like, okay, uh, you know, uh, Susmita and company uh, did the first American launch with the Skybox satellite in 2016. And now suddenly the door is ajar, it's not wide open. And all these Americans want to piggyback launch their satellites. You know, there aren't that many rockets that go up every every other month. So if you're not paying for the entire rocket launch, and if you're a secondary payload, then your opportunities are very few. So when we opened the door a little bit with the first Skybox satellite launch, it was called Skysat 3. And by the time we launched it, it was seven years and Google bought Skybox. So it was a Google satellite that we first launched. And by the way, that was Google's first own satellite. Up until then, they used to buy old CIA satellites. That is oh, also historical. That is very nobody historical. Knows this. Yeah, yeah, nobody knows this. This is the same thing because uh, for me, it was just this unawareness of like what was happening. And I, I don't know, there's a difference between when maybe other countries uh, do things and it just permeates through society. The narrative, the narrative in the, tw- in the last century was hijacked by Hollywood and NASA. And now that with social media and the world consciousness expanding, uh, we are getting to hear about other people and other things. And even then, I would say uh, US still dominates that um, you know, that sound space and mind space. Um, because not many people know that China is now overtaken the US in so many, so very many ways. So let's talk a little bit about uh, ISRO's space uh, or India's space program trajectory. Our very first launch was a sounding rocket launch. Uh, it was the Nike Apache, which was an American sounding rocket. And Sarabhai, uh, Homi Baba, uh, Dr. Pisaroti, and you know, a group of very young scientists who had Sarabhai had brought on board. They scouted the southern coast of Kerala and finally uh, sort of decided on a site in Thumba uh, where they set up the rocket launch pad. And this rocket launch essentially had a 30 kg payload which took photographs of you know, sort of coconut plantations in that area. So it was a demonstration, if you, if I may, of what you can do with a payload in space and sensors on that payload. Sarabhai wanted to show it to not only the scientific milieu of the country, but the political milieu of the country, the power uh, that space assets have, you know, how they could be used for applications here on Earth. So that was the first launch. And you, if you remember the Sputnik flew in 1957, so it was barely five years from then. 61 is when Yuri Gagarin, that was the first human space flight. And just two years later, uh, India did its first sounding rocket launch. Uh, I, as a schoolgirl, saw the first sounding rocket launch uh, of the Rohini sounding rocket um, at a place which was 14 kilometers from my grandfather's place in Odisha. Uh, in, it's called Chandipur on Sea. Um, So that was my first sounding rocket launch. Uh, In 1962, Sarabhai set up what was called INCOSPAR. INCOSPAR is a predecessor to ISRO. It stands for Indian National Committee for Space Research. And in late 1960s, after the Thumba Equatorial rocket launch pad was set up, um, Sarabhai, Abdul Kalam and others they had a conversation with the bishop of a church 
uh, in Tumba. Uh, it was a Mary Magdalene church, and they essentially convinced the bishop to allow them to use that area for um, further rocket development and rocket launches. So the bishop uh, gathered the fisher folk one day and he explained it to them uh, as to why it would be nice to hand over the church to these scientists and let them work from here and, you know, essentially build and fly rockets. Uh, so that that's where ISRO's, uh, you could say the first ISRO center in that sense came about in Kerala, you know, in Thumba. And in 1972, ISRO was officially incorporated as an organization. Uh, if you remember in 1972, like I said, the last Apollo landing happened. I'm just trying to sort of yeah. put the line in parallel. India launched its first uh, satellite called Aryabhatta in 1975. In um, 1975, there was also something very, uh, a very interesting experiment that we did with the Americans. So NASA and ISRO collaborated over a year between August of 1975 to July of 1976, where a NASA satellite called ATS-6 was used by Sarabhai and his team to broadcast informational education programs to 2,400 very, very remote villages across the country in five or six different states. Uh, again, a, a technology demonstration of the power of space applications, right? And in fact, also our first collaboration with the Americans. Um, that experiment was called SITE, S-I-T-E. It stands for Satellite Instructional Television Experiment. So if you ask me, India demonstrated direct-to-home television or direct-to-village television even before direct-to-home television happened. I mean, that's pioneering. People don't know about it. This right? is what Elon Musk is trying to do now, right? With, with Well, uh, he's doing with... broadband internet with uh, thousands of satellites. But direct-to-home television is what you and I in our living room get to get to Correct. see since, you know, the 90s, late 80s, actually. So India actually demonstrated direct-to-village. Let's call it direct-to-village instead of direct-to-home television. So that was path-breaking. And that happened because we had visionary leaders like Sarabhai. Um, and in 1979, India did its first rocket launch. It was called SLV, Satellite Launch Vehicle. The first launch was a failure. The second one, the year after, in 1980, was a success. And Abdul Kalam was leading that project. 1983 is when we launched our first, what I call a ComSat, a communication satellite called INSAT, INSAT 1A. Uh, we've had a series of INSAT satellites. Uh, these are used for telecommunication purposes, and these satellites fly at 36,000 kilometers from the Earth over the equator. We did our first Earth observation satellite launch in 1988. It was called IRS-1A. This is for using optical sensors, radar sensors to photograph the Earth and then process that imagery and use it for all kinds of applications, you know, everything from um, urban planning to resource management, uh, fisheries, agriculture, quite literally every sector has applications with this. Um, and in 1993, so almost 20 years after ISRO was incorporated, uh, we launched our first PSLV, the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, which is used by ISRO to launch Earth observation satellites and weather satellites. Um, 2001, we, which is the early part of this millennium, we did our first GSLV launch. Uh, let me explain a little bit. So any country that's launch capable, there are seven of those in the world, they usually have two rockets. One is a smaller rocket, which is used for launching Earth observation satellite in a what we call the sun synchronous orbit. It's an elliptical orbit over the poles. And the other is usually a heavy lifter, which carries megaton communication satellites to the geostationary transfer orbit, um, where we fly our INSAT satellites. So the GSLV flies COMSATs, the PSLV flies Earth observation satellites. So the first GSLV launch happened in 2001. And then I think um, it's this part of the millennium has sort of seen our foray into what we could we, we call planetary exploration. Is this kind of trajectory normal for other space organizations and countries as well? I mean, of course, we know the US and the Soviets had a 
like a underlying reason for why they were progressing so fast but it seems to me that you know india was also progressing under the radar but uh, clearly making big strides i think the evolutionary path for a space program for most com- for most countries whether it's the united states russia france india japan china has been similar i just think the priorities have been different so in the 60s and 70s uh united states and the erstwhile ussr were definitely locked in a in a cold war race right so they their milestones were very very different uh if you look at india or france for that matter our milestones have a parallel history you know we began with uh doing sounding rocket launches we started looking at okay so how do we uh, look at the earth and photograph so i think i think the evolution that i just explained with a broad sketchy dateline for india's space program evolution is similar to most other countries had it not been for the cold war i think both russia i mean now russia then ussr and the united states wouldn't have had such an accelerated program is what i'm saying but yeah i think i think the sequence of things the sequence of tech dev milestones would have been very similar yeah absolutely and and then of course once you're a mature space program uh once you can build your own satellites launch your own satellites operate your own satellites use them for a variety of applications the natural next step is planetary exploration and human space flight when i started uh, researching i think the first story uh uh that really struck me was was the story of rakesh sharma the first indian astronaut to go to space so i just uh wanted to get your perspective i know you you're well in the whole uh industry so i was wondering if you can firstly explain what happened and then what your thoughts were at that point so rakesh sharma was selected to fly on a indo soviet mission in 1982 Uh, I was in my early teens, and while he and his backup Ravish Malhotra were in training, uh, they went to Star City to train in Moscow. Um, so after they came back, uh, they sort of traveled uh, around the country, and I remember they showed up at the Space Application Center in Ahmedabad, which is one of the ISRO centers. And I, like many other school kids, did show up to shake their hands and to see, oh, wow. these guys are going to be flying into space. um so i think at that point i being a school kid who grew up around space people i thought that was the most natural thing to do so for me it was not a big deal that rakesh sharma was going to fly into space for me it was like oh lucky guy he's going to get to fly so i think symbolically to me it was a natural extension of the indo soviet friendship uh, as a child i grew up with amazing illustrated russian story books translated in english and in most of these illustrated stories there was always this cosmonaut which was a central figure uh so i grew up with the idea of cosmonautics it was integral to my growing up years so rakesh sharma flying was a very exciting thing for all of us not just school children every each one of us but it was more symbolic i don't think geopolitically it was now that when i look back in retrospect I don't think geopolitically it was yes it was a bit of a statement that uh Russia is going or USSR is going to fly uh an Indian cosmonaut into outer space but I don't think geopolitically it was as significant as say our moon landing that happened last month so it was a blimp in the geopolitical horizon uh what was exciting is what it did to the national psyche of the Indians what it did to our imagination as a subcontinent as a country of um you know millions of people it it kind of extracted us from our everyday mundane lives and suddenly took us soaring into a space that none of us had looked at closely i mean yes india was launching satellites india was launching rockets but a human in earth orbit circling the globe every 90 minutes now that's exciting that i think it really did something to our imagination his flight not so much geopolitically but in terms of our imagination leaders knew the power of space right and how that would oh, abso- absolutely 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 even india had already launched its first insat satellite 
Uh, India had already done its first rocket launch, you know, the SLV launch. So yeah, I think that space was fairly, see, human space flight is always the most difficult thing to do. Uh, so you're right. Some of the other milestones had already been accomplished by the major spacefaring countries by then. Yes. Yeah. While I guess it is only symbolic, um, uh, I, I wonder while I was doing my own research, whether that really propelled it, uh, propelled India to, uh, you know, have the courage to go deeper because it, it realized the people were on board. Uh, because, of course, India comes from a very different economic background compared to, you know, other yeah, countries. Yeah, but, that you know... Are, Yes, but India is also in a very special in a very special place because unlike the United States, unlike France, unlike many of the other major spacefaring nations like us, their space programs are often questioned by the politicians. Their budgets are questioned. In India, right from the very beginning, uh, as in when Sarabhai got the thing rolling, we have had, meaning ISRO has had, unwavering support, both of the public and our elected representatives in parliament. Ne we've never ever questioned our space program because uh, think about it, Sarabhai laid it on a solid foundation where he showed it um, in undeniably compelling ways that space can be used for good on earth, you know, and uh, improve the lives and livelihoods of people, even in the remotest parts of the country. So we've had public and political support um, throughout. So I don't think the Rakesh Sharma flight really did anything in terms of uh, adding to our courage index. I think ISRO scientists have always been courageous. Um, they do their things with practically zero hype and just keep on launching, unlike uh, the Hollywoodization of the American space program. So in that sense, um, the ISRO scientists have always been brave and they've always been bold. They've always done uh, daring next steps and uh, they've always had support of the government and the people. Do you think it's true that it might have been, uh, uh, that there might have been a large political incentive also? Oh yeah, I think there's always the election cycle and the political calculus. Um, whether it's the Chandrayaan-3 launch that happened last month and our current prime minister uh, very clearly and overtly leveraged it uh, to create a political um, image to run with it. So I think, yes, that happens. That happens. I mean, uh, John F. Kennedy did it with the Apollo Correct. missions, right? Yeah. Uh, Biden has done it with the Artemis missions. So yeah. that's a natural thing to happen for politicians to... Um, uh, capitalize on these milestone events that's that's perfectly normal it happens all the time why is space such a powerful symbol for humanity it's been within the realm of mystery divinity scientific curiosity hope and even within culture for since ancient times so why do you think it never fails to capture the human imagination i think this whole idea of looking up and looking beyond um, it, it's something we as a species um, are always drawn into. Um, if you ask me, to me, the sky is, is our observatory, whether we're looking at it with, a, with our naked eyes or with instruments. And what's really pretty sexy about the horizon, if you ask me, is let's say you're standing at land's end and looking at the ocean and looking beyond, you cannot but help want to be on the other side. I think it's it's inherent in human nature to want to explore. You know, when people ask me, why should we explore space? Um, to me, it's very similar to asking, why should we climb the Himalayas? Because it's there. Um, and I think the, the other thing we should, we should also kind of, when I think about this is, it's been beautifully portrayed, not only in poetry, um, in both fiction and science fiction and non-fiction books, and even films. Uh, one of my favorite films um, by my mentor, Arthur Clarke um, and Stanley Kubrick, 2001, A Space Odyssey. If you look at the opening sequence and the way they have depicted the birth of intelligence, of human intelligence, uh, going from being primates to becoming two-legged beings where we use our hands and tools to do some very powerful things, this intelligent 
evolves over time uh, and it grows sufficiently enough to for us to leave Earth's gravity and achieve space travel. And the other fantastic thing that I remember from the film is the onboard computer, HAL 9000. I bring up HAL because in, in contemporary times, we're all discussing uh, you know, the impact, the long-term impact of artificial intelligence. And HAL is exactly that. It's a sentient uh, artificial intelligence character that is not only can it control all the systems of Discovery One, the interplanetary ship, but it also interacts with the crewmen, uh, David Bauman and Frank Poole. So I think those were our first insights into what could artificial intelligence possibly do with face recognition, speech recognition, speech synthesis, uh, interpreting emotional behaviors, imitating emotional behaviors, uh, uh, art appreciation, uh, natural language processing. So I think what Clark and Kubrick uh, managed to capture in the 60s is something we are now starting to live in real life. Um, so I think, I think to me, space and science fiction is sort of, it, it brings our worlds, um, it just makes it more, more exciting to be living in these times, to be projecting the future and then inventing the future as we go along. It's interesting that you made the comparison with 2001 Space Odyssey because like you said, it's, it almost feels like we are in that moment and all these features, you know, which, was inst which were instilled in this AI kind of already exist. Before we officially started recording, we were having a discussion about the image that Chandrayaan 3 had taken and released. You know, it, it, it's interesting. I had no idea that there was an AI layer to this image. Uh, maybe not the official version, but the one that's circulating around. <laughs> I mean, this got me thinking actually about how when the U.S. Did, the, did its historic moon landing and there's so much hype about is it real or is it not? You know, yeah. while we're entering this new age of AI, where does that leave truth? I mean, how do we believe anything? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question. Before I answer it, I, I, should, I should definitely add that the AI edited version of uh, Vikram the Lander of the Chandrayaan-3 mission uh, was very poetic. Uh, in fact, more beautiful than the original image, if you ask me. Uh, it brought out the magnificent desolation of the lunar landscape, that pitch black horizon. I mean, imagine how lonely and lost you would feel if you had to be there and what kind of psychological things it would do to your mind. Uh, I mean, being a designer of space habitats and stuff, I think to me, the psychological aspects of, um, you know, a planetary destination, and if you have to spend um, uh, long periods of time in such a place are of, are, are, are of consequence. Um, so I think, um, yeah, some people, you are not the first one who said that if this is what an AI edit in 2023 looks like, uh, what about the Apollo photographs? Or what about the photos from the Russian missions back then? I mean, were they doctored? Were they, you know, um, enhanced in any way? Um, so I think the answer would be a cautious, most likely. Um, everybody has done it over the centuries, over the millennia, uh, in order to exaggerate, in order to create awe, in order to show what kind of a powerful nation you are or civilization you are. So I think there is definitely uh, that possibility and probably they did play around with the images, yes. Um, but that said, I think AI edits, the way they are done now is very different from the way you would doctor an image back in the 60s. Um, so I think the AI edit that you saw of the Chandrayaan-3 lander is, uh, in my view, uh, way superior because I think in this case, the rendering of the landscape is quite authentic. Um, you, An you instant don't, you also, can't... I guess. Yes, yes, I think so. Um, mm. And I wouldn't worry about it too much. I think um, it's not so much about creating uh, a fake narrative with an AI edit like the one we saw of the Chandrayaan-3 lander. I think it is also 
uh, a freedom of expression thing, any young person or any person of any age can take a raw photograph and play with it to inspire oneself um, and you know, eventually inspire others with that image. So I think there has to be that creative freedom um, to playing around with imagery or videos for that matter. How sophisticated are the cameras actually that are on board these missions? Because today we have uh, minute cameras on our phones that are super powerful. I guess my question is, why aren't we loading these satellites with amazing cameras and getting like the best images uh, by default? So I think um, the word camera here needs to be broadened a bit because any spacecraft or any lander um, has a suite of sensors. So uh, one of the ways is to think of a camera as the one you have on your phone, uh, which takes photographs in a certain range of the electromagnetic spectrum. But as you know, the electromagnetic spectrum is fairly wide and there are different frequencies there and you can have sensors for these various frequencies in the spectrum. And using that, you can detect different things, you can study different things, you can investigate differently. So there are multiple sensors on any given spacecraft, whether it's orbiting a body or whether it's landed somewhere. Uh, now, the camera that you are referring to, as in the camera on your phone, I think a similar camera is on the rover, Pragya. They're calling it the nav cam. Uh, think of it like uh, a little thing on the rover head, which turns around and scans the landscape that it has to navigate to make sure that it doesn't run into any kind of obstruction like a, like a boulder or a big rock that it can't navigate or fall into a crater and be badly damaged. So the nav cam from what I remember, I might be wrong because I have not looked it up, but what I vaguely remember, the nav cam we have on the rover has one megapixel resolution. What I'm understanding is that it it is a matter of minimizing excess, right? Yes, yes. Every ounce Every ounce counts, but also your intent, right? Your intent. It's like photographic capability. Photography is part of very many different requirements that you have on this mission. So there are probes. There are uh, other kinds of sensors. Uh, so the, the megapixel camera is just one of many things in that suite. I was actually also quite surprised whether it's ISRO or other agencies, the, the actual images are not as high definition as maybe one would expect in today's world. It's true. I think the Japanese have uh, are the most keen, I would say, on high resolution imagery and video, which is why the 2007 moon orbiter that Japan launched, it was called Kaguya, had high definition video on board, which is why we got those beautiful um uh, videos of the earth rise shot from Kaguya. So the Japanese are very keen on their on their photographic skills of their orbiters and, and stuff. Now they have just sent a lander. The lander is supposed to land or attempt landing in February. I'm sure it has better cameras because yeah, the Japanese, for, for them, uh, having uh, high-res cameras and video uh, capability is very important. I wish that would become our priority too also because it would be great to get Amazing images. You know, <laughs> our next mission, our next Chandrayaan mission is with the Japanese. Okay, that's good. We are, we are doing an Indo-Japan <laughs> collaboration uh, uh, to the moon. Yeah, so I think that one will have great cameras. Amazing. I can't wait. <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to that mission myself because I think uh, both culturally and technologically, uh, Japan and India coming together is going to be fantastic. On that point, you know, my broader curiosity is to do with like space as a cultural force again while we we know i guess in a way how to how to harness this this energy the question then becomes what do we do with that i think space as a cultural force is very very significant right um even with the launch of sputnik or the flight of yuri gagarin um it's sort of em embedded itself in the collective psyche of of humanity Everybody locked into those momentous uh, flights and it did inspire all of them, irrespective of their geography. And if you look at the 1960s when the space programs 
starting to uh, to started to happen. I think the 1960s was a very special time. It was post World Wars, right? Uh, it was a time of peace. It was also a time of industrial growth. Um, it was a time when even our nation was a newly independent republic, and we were very uh, excited about nation building. Um, so I think the vision of the future in the 60s across the globe um, was very, very, a very progressive vision for the future, very optimistic vision for the future, not just in space exploration, but graphic design, uh, movies, architecture, design, the arts, the entire gamut. And if, if I think of cultural iconic milestones in the exploration roadmap, one was definitely the Sputnik beep that NASA captured and has used it in movies since. And then it's also, you've seen it in documentaries, you know, anyone with a shortwave radio could listen to Sputnik beeping as it went around the earth. Can you imagine? I mean, it's it's like your heartbeat. The second cultural icon in, in this trajectory would be the blue marble or the blue spaceship shot by the Apollo astronaut Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt on the Apollo 17 mission. So they were flying to the moon and they shot the earth 33,000 kilometers from the earth, right? So that blue marble led to what I would call an environmental consciousness, the idea that we need to take care of our planet, right? So I think that was a very iconic moment in the world history, in the space exploration history. And personally, I think in 2007, when the Japanese spacecraft Kaguya took these beautiful high definition videos of the earth rise, you know, um, from the moon, you can see the earth rise and the earth set. And those high definition videos of Kaguya are very, very poetic. I don't think there's anybody who isn't touched by these moments, um, including the last month when uh, Vikram landed, our lander on, on this near the South Pole. And the rover, Pragya, sent back the first image of the lander on the lunar surface. It, it was one of those cultural moments. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think it's it's very very significant. Space as a cultural force is, um, as or even more important, if you ask me, than the the technological side of of the story. As you were explaining, I, it also made me realize like the three references you had given all kind of brought humanity towards another perspective of Earth, right? I mean, while we are talking about space exploration, but it was it almost seems like we needed this other perspective to understand what we had. I think that's the word. I think that's the word, Harsha, perspective. I think it, it, it and context. Yeah. I think it gives, a, gives us a whole new perspective and it puts things in context. It puts us in context. Uh, we, what are we or who are we in this grander scheme of the universe, you know? If that's the case, then why are we going to other planets, right? I mean... Why, why is all of a sudden everyone going to the moon again? For any spacefaring country, um, I consider India in, in sort of the top six spacefaring countries. We have the United States, we have Russia, we have China, we have India, we have Japan, we have France, and then we have the rest of them. Um, so each of these countries, once you have perfected the art of making satellites and launching satellites, the natural next inclination is to go explore the solar system, which is our neighborhood, quite literally, right? And while the moon has become sort of, you know, it's it's part of everyday news now, if I may say, um, the fact is that these space agencies, uh, either individually or collectively, are also looking at other parts of our solar system. We are looking at Venus, we are looking at moons of Jupiter, moons of Saturn, Neptune. Uh, so we are not only fixated on the moon, but it just so happens that moon has now come back uh, into prominence because in a way, moon is our nearest neighbor. If we are to go to further, you know, further out in the solar system, say Europa, which is one of the moons, um, or if you want to go to Mars, Moon becomes a stepping stone 
Moon becomes the first place where we can demonstrate, technologically speaking, that yes, we can go to a, another celestial body, we can set up a base, we can have some sort of human presence, we can maybe even use in-situ resources to build, to make rocket fuel, to harvest water. So that becomes, if you ask me, a test bed. The moon becomes a test bed for journeys further out. And therefore, moon has now become the next important destination. It was, remember, in the 60s when there was the Cold War space race between USSR and the United States. Um, we had about a, half a dozen human landings. Uh, the Russians landed Lunacord, a rover, multiple times. The last lunar landing by the Americans was in 1972. The last lunar landing, successful one, by the Russians was in 1976. After that, there was a huge gap of almost 50 years. And then it was the Chinese who successfully landed on the moon. Uh, so in the last 10 years, in the last decade, the only country that's landed three successive times um, successfully are the Chinese. And in the third attempt, they even brought back lunar samples, which again happened after a gap of 40 years. So China, in that sense, became the first country among spacefaring nations to re-demonstrate or, or, or achieve soft landing on the moon. Uh, and now India has become, in, in recent years, the second country to soft land successfully on the moon, as we did last month. So the Chandrayaan-3 landing was very, very significant. In fact, if you ask me, it has started a new era of space exploration. Because landing in what we call high latitude near polar regions, so we landed very close to the South Pole, near the South Pole, is a lot more difficult than landing in, you know, equatorial, near equatorial uh, latitudes uh, for multiple reasons. One is the landing terrain is very tricky. The It's a, got a harsher thermal environment. The visibility of the earth from that point is, is not that good. So communication is harder. So landing where Chandrayaan landed is, is uh, an especially difficult place to land. And the South Pole is of great interest to all of us because the, in the shadow, in the dark shadow regions inside the craters in the polar regions, we have confirmed uh, that there exists water ice. And if there's water ice, it means we can harvest that, make water out of it, use it for you know, extracting oxygen, for breathing, for rocket fuel. So it becomes a very important resource. So it, it makes it very, very significant. And now the United States has what they call the return to the moon program, and it's called Artemis. And they are planning an orbiting station around the moon, just as they we have the International Space Station, which is currently orbiting the Earth. Similarly, China also has plans to put an orbiting station around the moon, and both China and the United States are planning a human base on the moon. Uh, there are certain countries which are aligning with the United States, and there are some countries that are aligning with China. So there are two blocks now in terms of um, setting up lunar bases, taking humans to the moon. Um, but it's it's really a bit worrying as well. Uh, having been in the space industry for over a quarter of a century, I think uh, those of us who are cognizant of the fact that the line that separates exploration from exploitation is very, very blurred. We are starting to look into how can space law, enforceable international multilateral space laws ensure that we don't um, make, I wouldn't even call it mistakes because we did it deliberately here on earth. How do we prevent mass extraction of resources? How do we, so, so let me give you a couple of examples. The United States during the Obama time, they passed a legislation in Congress which allows American companies to mine resources on other celestial bodies, bring them back to earth and even own them, which in a way goes against the principle of the global commons, which goes against the principles of the outer space treaty. 
A similar law was passed by Luxembourg, the Luxembourg Parliament, um, a few years after the United States passed it, a space mining, asteroid mining law. Um, you know, the United Arab Emirates, which uh, their economy is largely, largely a fuel, fossil fuel based economy. So they have now joined um, the space, um, you know, this, the, the universe of space faring countries. And they are pretty honest about it. They're like, okay, the resources on Earth are finite. So it's time to go out and prospect for resources elsewhere in our solar system. So I think given that a lot of the attention is now shifting to resources, it is inevitable that government space programs and private companies will start looking at these possibilities, right? And even before we talk about, you know, extracting resources or moon or other celestial objects, I think the other concern many of us space environmentalists have is near Earth orbit. If you look at low Earth orbit, um, anything from Earth to up to 2000 kilometers, we call it low Earth orbit. It is hugely cluttered. We have more than 300 million man-made debris objects orbiting the Earth as we speak. And each of these debris objects, whether it is as small as a paint speck to as large as a dead satellite or a discarded part of an upper stage of a rocket, is moving at enormous speeds. These debris objects in low Earth orbit are moving at 28,000 kilometers per hour. So if uh, you must have seen the movie Gravity, which is in, in a way a visualization of what will happen if there's a chain reaction of debris collisions in low Earth orbit, right? So we are already very, very concerned that we humans have trashed near Earth orbit and made it a very dangerous place. So I think personally, uh, I'm very concerned about the moon as well. It's okay to set up a human base. It's okay to have some kind of presence to do scientific and exploratory work, but it is certainly not okay to uh, go for resource extraction in a big way. So that, that is a concern, yes. Where does China stand in all of this? China is like uh, any other country. I think there's no difference between the United States and China as far as moon exploration is concerned. I think both of them, uh, if you look at the roadmap, um, both of them are planning human bases. Both of them are planning orbit orbiting stations. And I think... Uh, I have no doubt in my mind that both of them will be prospecting and extracting resources, uh, both for utilization on the moon, but also maybe for utilization off the moon. You know, I don't think the vision China has for its space program or for its uh, moon missions is any different from that of the United States or, or Russia or any of the other, other space programs. Where does India stand in this because i think while you mentioned in us and and china may be similar but on earth they are opposing forces no that's a good question i think india up until recently um i hadn't heard anybody within isro uh talk about resource uh, utilization resource extraction on other you know on moon or elsewhere in the solar system they only talked about it in scientific terms, in exploration terms, in technology demonstration terms. Uh, I think that narrative is starting to change with the current government. Uh, so Prime Minister Modi's government, uh, I've even heard bureaucrats uh, use words like resource uh, utilization, mining very freely. So clearly it's entered the Indian vocabulary uh, with our current government. I hadn't heard it until then. So even if you look at our new space policy that came out earlier this year, uh, there is a clear mention of uh, space resources. Um, so clearly it's it's now part of, it's, it's just recently become part of the Indian vocabulary. It wasn't the case in the decades prior to this one. Do you see this as um, an opportunity where, I mean, India has to be part of right i mean it's i guess any nation that's going to the moon has to have now some policy otherwise it's left behind you know in a way oh absolutely i think uh, space policy is very very important and india finally does have a space policy which is uh, 
fairly comprehensive, but I think it, it needs to be expanded even further. Um, India signed the Artemis Accords, which is a US-led bilateral accord that 28 countries have signed with the US. Um, and India is also a signatory to what is called the Moon Agreement. So the United Nations has an outer space affairs office. And there are three or four important international treaties. One is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. The other one is the Moore Agreement of 1979. And I think, this is just a personal opinion, it, it's not necessarily the opinion of ISRO or the government. I think the fact that India has now signed the Artemis Accords with the United States, um, we are now becoming part of a minilateral club uh, that the U.S. has created, is creating, is expanding. So India should go back and ratify the Moon Agreement that it had signed earlier. So we've signed it, but we haven't ratified it yet. Because by ratifying it, we as a nation will send out a strong signal to the international community that we will, while we have signed the Artemis Accords, and we will collaborate with the Americans, we are not going to toe the American line. We will continue to take a multilateral approach to space exploration instead of a unilateral or a minilateral approach. So I think as a nation, we need to send that message. Uh, there are only a few countries that have signed both. India, Australia, and France are examples. And is this related to sending because I know with the Artemis program, this is also the mission of this is to send humans back onto into the moon, right? That's right. That's right. I'm curious to know when India is planning to send its next uh, astronaut. Would it be related to this mission or would it be a, com a completely separate mission? Okay, so there are three countries currently that have the capability to launch humans into outer space. The first two are obviously uh, Russia and the United States. China has also had an independent human space program for over 15 years now. They're now, I think they've already finished their second space station, the Tiangong 2. Um, and India has also been developing a human space program for over a decade now, because it takes a long time to become capable uh, you know, of launching humans into outer space. So we are planning to launch our indigenously made human ferry called Gaganyan 1, uh, probably sometime uh, next year. As oh, wow. it'll be the first flight will be a test flight, uh, uncrewed. There will be two uncrewed flights, and then there will be a crew of three that will be launched on Gaganyan. So we will become the fourth country in the world to launch humans into low Earth orbit. Um, so, so, I mean, if you, if you look at um, the countries that are capable of doing so, India is not there yet. Uh, but the other three countries are. So I think, again, India, uh, I cannot speak for ISRO, um, and I cannot speak for the government. Um, but I think someone who has worked in human space exploration for over 15 years uh, with the Americans, with the Europeans, with the Japanese and the Russians through shuttle Mir missions in the late 90s and then the International Space Station Program, I would want India's uh, approach uh, to human space flight to be one where we don't need to spend uh, very many years in low Earth orbit because the United States, Russia, and partners have already done it. You know, the space station has been up there. The construction began in 1998. So it's so I think whatever we as humanity needed to learn in terms of the physiological effects of living in microgravity, the psychological effects of living in confined compact spaces, the kind of experiments that can be done in microgravity, that knowledge base has already been set. So I think India has that advantage that they can maybe spend, you know, a uh, half a decade in low Earth orbit, but they could accelerate let's say, sending humans to the moon, because a lot of work has already been done by these other countries. And India has always been open to collaboration and cooperation with these countries. So my idea of India's trajectory in human spaceflight is launch Gaganyaan, 
demonstrate that we can send astronaut astronauts into low Earth orbit, uh, even launch a small mini space station. So essentially a pressurized module where you can demonstrate that you can live in a short sleeve environment and do your experiments and housekeeping and all that. But don't stay in low Earth orbit uh, for a few decades. Move on to human presence on the moon and either do it independently or collaboratively with the other countries. Do you see this happening soon? Like I know you mentioned the next year would be Gaganyan. Well, you know, I think I think with the successful landing of uh, Vikram, the lander last month near the South Pole, uh, India as an international partner, in my view, can offer resupply missions to the moon for the first human base, for example, right? Even if we don't have a human-related spacecraft yet, uh, which is going to be Gaganyan, we already have demonstrated capab capability for precision soft landing uh, in a difficult terrain on the moon. So whether it's the United States or anyone else who sets up a moon base, they will need countries, partner countries, collaborators, who can land, uh, you know, landers near the base with resupply. So it could be, uh, you know, we need fuel resupply, we need food re resupply, we need all, all kinds of resupplies that you, you need in any typical human space flight mission. So India can already offer that capability, which is a huge capability, because you need to think from Earth to survive on the moon, right? So in India can already, I think India already has a, a part of the puzzle that can enable long duration human presence on the moon. One thing we, I think, didn't touch upon was Mangalyan, the Mars orbiter mission. Where does this place uh, fall into the other missions? Because it was also now, after that, India became the fourth country to enter the Martian orbit, right? So, I mean, that's also historic. Well, India became, yeah, but also India for the Mangalyan mission in 2014, we became the first country to make it to Mars orbit successfully in our maiden attempt. Okay. So before Correct. us, no other country had made it to the Martian orbit in its first attempt. So that was a big first. And similarly, China became the first country to land successfully on Mars in its first attempt. Because, you know, soft landing on planetary surfaces is still a huge technological challenge. Um, yeah, so I think Mangalyan mission, that was the cool thing about, about the Mangalyan mission. The other cool thing, if you ask me about Mangalyan, was that we accomplished the Mangalyan mission within 18 months, uh, rather 14 months from the date the budget was approved. 14 months is barely a year and two months. Uh, usually, usually the NASA's of the world take five to seven years for a planetary mission. So, you know, when everybody talks about the price tag of Indian missions or ISRO missions, um, they try to stereotype India. And that's because partly because of ignorance uh, mixed with arrogance and other things. So the reason India's missions are cost effective, uh, if, you, if you go online and read these very many articles, they're always comparing it to Hollywood films and Bollywood films and whatnot. I think what they don't understand is our planetary missions have been accomplished in time frames of 18 to 30 months. Whereas a, a similar mission by, say, a European country or by NASA would be anywhere from five years or more, right? So the time duration is much longer. I was talking to the uh, head of the French Space Agency uh, liaison office in Bangalore, and he was telling me that ISRO scientists uh, salaries are comparable to French scientists who work for the French Space Agency. They're less than the American uh, Americans who work for NASA, but they're comparable to the French Space Agency employees. So it's not even that our wages are very low, right? We have compressed schedules, compressed mission schedules, which speaks for organizational efficiency, by the way. Uh, think about it. Uh, and um, and yes, we do things cost effectively. We source most of the components and parts from various vendors. Uh, many of them are uh, small companies, medium-sized companies, large companies that have been supplying uh, parts and systems to ISRO for almost uh, three, four decades now. 
uh, it's it's a bit like um, you know Indian Space Agency is like a startup that was that happened in the early late sixties early seventies. They have always had the startup mindset, how to make do with less. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, um, this French friend of mine pointed out that when the West approaches a mission, they always take a Formula One approach. You know, it has to be the most expensive, the most sophisticated. Whereas India takes a Jeep approach. It has to be robust. It has to, you know, get the mission accomplished, um, sturdy, pragmatic, cost effective. I, I think that's a great comparison. Who wants a Formula One when the Jeep can go to the moon and explore for you, you know? So obviously the Jeep is going to cost less than your Formula One. I think it's important that you make that distinction and also bring it out in this way because you're right. Now that I think about it, a lot of the headlines is like trivializes it down to to how much money you save. But whereas while the reality is, I guess that's what everyone is trying to do, but but it changes the narrative. Yeah, but it's a very racist take on uh, on this. Instead of, uh, I'm I'm planning to write an opinion piece on this. Um, so so to to bring this out, I, I think it's it's not surprising if you look at uh, uh, the West. They have very little understanding of India, let alone the space program. Uh, and if you layer it with uh, a nice big dollop of uh, arrogance, then all you see is, oh my goodness, a poor country making cheap stuff. No, absolutely not. We are making sophisticated, cutting edge, robust, practical things at a fraction of the cost. Whereas uh, there are countries that are blowing billions on missions, which is not necessary. Do you think there's any space for ISRO to do a better marketing job of itself? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The PR uh, dimension of ISRO has been non-existent. One, ISRO doesn't have a budget for PR. Uh, by comparison and contrast, NASA has a huge budget for PR. No. So I think, uh, and the ISRO scientists don't even ask, as far as I know, they don't even ask the government to give them uh, PR funds. Because see, the government will allocate a budget based on what you ask for it for the next financial year. So ISRO, usually what it does, it, it lists the missions that are coming up and they estimate a budget and tell the government, okay, this is how much we need. And the government has always given them what they've asked for. Yeah. So I think they just need to put it into their budget line item. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I agree. I think we need a yeah. much better PR. Uh, our, even our own people are not aware of some of the fantastic accomplishments that have happened other than Chandrayaan and Mangalyaan. For example, India flew a scaled version of the space shuttle. You know, we have a space shuttle. Did you know that? We flew no, it. A uh, this is version. the first time I'm hearing <laughs> about it. Yeah, we flew that in uh, May of 2016 and successfully. Mm. We call it the reusable launch vehicle. So okay. yeah, I think we need to share all of these exciting things with the public and with the world at large and do, uh, and we can do it. I mean, we have fantastic uh, advertising professionals, PR professionals, designers. Uh, it's just that it's not on ISRO's mandate. Obviously, you're in the industry, so you're way more in tune with all of this. But from an outside perspective, you know, this is what I see. And it's interesting to hear the other side also. It'll also happen with a generational shift. I think the previous generations of ISRO scientists were so focused on making India technology independent, on doing the hard stuff, you know. And now when you see the younger cadre in ISRO, in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, they have a slightly different approach to marketing and PR of the good stuff they're doing. So, so I think ISRO was an introverted organization for many decades. They were just happy building and launching stuff. Let's put it that way. They're scientists, yeah. you know, that's which is important. What they enjoy. Yeah, which, which is, is important. very important. Yeah. <laughs> so they had that focus. They never lost focus. And now I think it's starting to change. I think the younger cadre wants uh, us to do, meaning us, meaning uh, ISRO and the country to do better PR. Talking about change, I think this is a good segue to explore how the whole space industry and exploration itself is changing. I think in the last century, the second half of the last century, uh, most government missions and, and mandates were driven by governments. 
And in this century, starting with um, the early part of this century, you can see that private companies are starting to um, craft a direction uh, for the future of space, you know, exploration and exploitation, I think, uh, as well. So, so if you think about when did privatization start happening, it started happening in the 1980s, first in the United States, then France. Um, and privatization in India is now starting to happen. What I mean by that is, yes, for the last 50 years, ISRO did reach out to um, big companies like l &T, the Tatas, Godrej and others, as well as small family-run businesses, uh, and medium-sized companies to build parts for them, to build systems for them. But that was only on an as-needed basis. It was not an industry. So these companies were catering to whatever ISRO needed. It was more like uh, social service and nation building. Only in recent years has the government finally acknowledged that it needs to liberalize the Indian space economy. It needs to let private players not only build things for ISRO, but compete internationally and cater to an international space marketplace, which is growing, which is huge already. It's like $400 billion plus market. Um, but let's talk about the international scene a little bit. So I think the old space companies, such as Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Ariane Space, they have been around since the last century, right? And the new space companies, such as SpaceX or Blue Origin, happened in this millennium. And the approaches taken by the old space companies is somewhat different from what the new space companies, the way they approach space. Yeah. The new space companies are a lot more agile, a lot more fast moving, a lot more um, risk friendly. Um, so, so, you know, even things like reusable rockets, it's an old idea, but why did it take a SpaceX to go out and do it? Because you have to go the extra mile and not become uh, complacent with government contracts coming in all the time. And remember, all of these private companies that I just mentioned, they are all uh, funded uh, with billions of dollars of taxpayer money through NASA and DOD, or whichever country it is, their, their government. Right? So while they are private, they are, they are driven by uh, taxpayer funds. So it's not exactly private, private, if you ask me. But anyway, let's also think about uh, space tourism companies like Virgin Galactic or Blue Origin has the Blue Shepherd. In the last half of uh, the second half of the last century and up until now, let's say about 600 government civil servant astronauts have flown into outer space. Okay. It's a handful. Think about it. 60 years. <laughs> 60 years, 600. I mean, not exact numbers, but that's nothing. It's small, right? yeah, it's small. Very small. So what happened to commercial aviation in the last century will happen to private space flight in this century uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is flying into low Earth orbit was difficult back then. The kind of rockets we had back then, you know, when Yuri Gagarin and Glenn and those guys flew, you would pull several Gs when the rocket would take off. So you had to be a fighter pilot to pull those Gs. Now, with the arrival of the space shuttle, the American space shuttle, the number of Gs you had to pull when you went up into space was about uh, one I think, 6G and a 3G mark. So if you could be on a roller coaster, an extreme roller coaster, you could go to space. You didn't have to be a fighter pilot. So now we are in that era where, you know, ordinary people who can do extreme Gs on roller coasters can go to outer space. But the thing is, it's still very expensive to launch, which is why not everybody. But I think that's also going to change in the coming decades. Is this low, uh, earth, low earth orbit where all the space debris is that you were mentioning earlier? Oh, absolutely. Which is why we have to dodge the space station, orbiting station out of debris path all the time. Yes. Wow. This seems complicated. Very complicated. Even if you pay your way and, you know, get to fly on a Blue Shepherd or uh, the Virgin spaceship. Um, but by the way, these tourism companies are not, orbit or not offering orbital flights yet. They're only offering you suborbital flights. So you just go up, look at the curvature of the Earth, float free for a few seconds, and you come back down. You know that, right? It's suborbital. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going around the Earth yet. 
but I think I think that's this century. Those are the kind of things you will see happening. Uh, but it's a much more complicated century than the last one. We are dealing with climate change here on Earth. We are dealing with um, uh, environment. You know, uh, space debris. Um, you know, in a way that has been un that is unprecedented. So it's not exactly all hunky dory as things were in the last century. So we are in a much more complicated crisis situation now. Space tourism is, I guess, one aspect. Do you see any other uh, opportunities as an as an oh, individual yes. entrepreneur oh, yes. beyond this? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I think what what we are starting to see is the emergence of a low Earth orbit economy, what we call in our space circles Leo economy. What I mean by that is there are these new opportunities coming up for entrepreneurs to, let's say, do orbital repairs, orbital refueling, orbital decluttering, orbital uh, debris warning systems. Uh, so these are the kind of new services that are opening up because space is becoming a busy place, a crowded place, right? So the Leo economy is starting to grow and create opportunities for entrepreneurs. The other good thing is that unlike the late, uh, you know, the last century, in this century, a lot of components are available off the shelf. You know what happened with computing in the 90s? We went from those large clunky computers to laptops, uh, right? It's happening with satellites in this first half of this century. We can now build satellites you know, fairly sophisticated satellites, not super sophisticated, but fairly sophisticated satellites in our garages. Because a lot of these components are now what we call COTS, commercial off-the-shelf components. So that has accelerated uh, entrepreneurial adventures. <laughs> you know, um, there are companies that are brand new and they are going to be launching an entire constellation of hyperspectral satellites. That's fairly sophisticated stuff. And that wouldn't have been possible in the last century. So I think for entrepreneurs, the new space people, it's an exciting time ahead. But in terms of uh, companies putting up thousands of satellites, mega constellations, it's a huge concern for the space environment. And uh, even though it is a cosmic commons, there are no laws that prevent a company like say, for example, SpaceX to put up 42,000 satellites in low Earth orbit. That should not be allowed because that three-dimensional space around the earth belongs to humanity. So if one single private entity puts up that many satellites, uh, not only do we have debris implications, it gets in the way of ground-based astronomy. You know, ground-based astronomers are already complaining because those shiny objects get in the way of their looking out. Yeah, I didn't even uh, think about that. Oh, yeah. yeah and okay. in, in a way, this is colonization 2.0. It's a land grab, if you ask me because there are no laws to prevent it. And that is extremely distressing and also a great opportunity for space lawyers to put their heads together and bring in laws. But it's very difficult to get consensus in the United Nations for uh, these big companies and wealthy nations to commit to uh, responsible behavior. It can go in any direction. And I don't know, I, my personal feeling is that the it's going to mirror what's happening on earth and i don't know if that's a good thing your instincts are correct i would i would say the same thing because we homo sapiens are very good at not only uh wanting to explore but wanting to dominate yeah so unfortunately i think uh, the consequences are going to be dire in the long term on a another note maybe more hopeful uh optimistic <laughs> note yes uh, where where do you think we should go next as a species? I, I think one of the best places to be um, is our is our blue spaceship where you and I are right now sitting and having this Zoom chat. Uh, if you remember William Shatner, you know, Captain Kirk from Star Trek, he flew on Blue Origins Blue Shepherd. And when he came back in one of his interviews, he said that when I got to the edge of space, all I could see was a cold expanse of darkness and death. And when I look down at the fuzzy, brown, white, blue uh, home, you know, thing that I just came from, I was like, oh my God, what we have on earth 
is such a such a cozy place to be. So I think to answer your question, I think um, uh, um, we we really need to realize that we already have a great planet that we are on, and we need to do a lot more to try and um, alter lifestyles that we have and, and and to take care of this planet. I know it all sounds very cliched, but it's very, very important. I do not believe in what these techno prophets like Musk and Bezos want to feed us with that, you know, Mars is our planet B. It's not our planet B. In fact, Mars used to have life at one point and it became what it is now. And Earth is heading that way. Oh, wow. So I think we should, we should uh, in terms of what are the exciting destinations for exploration, I would say uh, some of the moons of Jupiter and, and Saturn are very exciting places to be. One of them being Europa, which is like a water, it's called water and water ice. Um, I also think the planets which are closer to the sun, like Venus, um, is, a, is a great planet for us to maybe not send humans, but robotic probes to understand how uh, the greenhouse effect works, how global warming happens, to kind of understand how we can save our Earth from, you know, or rather the homo sapiens on Earth from perishing. Um, so for now, I think we should focus on the solar system. And we are anyway sending out uh, uh, spacecraft like Voyager and others into, into deep space. I was talking to Siddharth, uh, my husband, this morning about quantum computing. And one of the great things that will happen with quantum computing is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, <laughs> will, will advance um, like uh, tremendously, right? We've been searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, you know, the SETI program for years now. And of course, everybody wants to believe there are aliens out there and, you know, they come and always land in America. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, again, in New York City. life <laughs> in New York, City, yes, exactly. In so, Times Square, sorry, to be more specific. Times Square, yeah, with all the neon. Uh, no, I think I think the 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 grand question has always been: Is there intelligent life elsewhere? Of course, I'm sure there is, and way more intelligent than us. Are we a little stupid and always looking for carbon-based life forms, life forms that look like us? Yes, of course, because we want them to look like us. Uh, they probably don't look like us at all. And they probably don't even communicate like us. So, um, but I think the next quarter of a century, we are going to see some dramatic things happening because of quantum computing, because of artificial intelligence. Um, so I think we need to meet again in 25 years from now, Harsha. Yes, see where we are. definitely. My next question was going to be, are, are we alone in this universe? But I think you, you answered it there and now that you frame it within tech within AI, the ai revolution you know with technology getting cheaper uh, and quantum know, computing and, and quantum, quantum computing. computing i mean yeah. who knows maybe all of these like you said forces will come together and i mean we can't even imagine what the next phase of space could look like yeah i think i think i think it's going to blow our mind what what we'll see 25 years from now uh, if we look back from where we are today well, I mean, on that note, I just would like to, you know, thank you again so much for uh, giving us your time to explore uh, a bit more in depth into into the different dynamics playing out in space. Uh, you know, I, I know I've learned a lot from this conversation and, and uh, I know the people viewing this also will. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Asha. It's my life, you know, I enjoy it. So it's not it's not a profession. I love it. Thank you. Thanks for having me.